Hey everybody, Chad Wesley Smith here for Juggernaut Training Systems. Today we are going to be talking about determining your phase length and proportion uh, to create the best phasic structure uh, to optimize your program. What I'm going to be talking about today is going to build on some previous lectures I've been doing here on the channel, uh, particularly the video on finding your MRV, finding your frequency. Make sure you go back, watch all of those, check out my powerlifting program design manual, and all of these resources put together are gonna help you design better, more effective programs for yourself, for athletes you coach, for now and the long term. So hopping right in to uh, determining phase length and proportion, the first thing that we need to do is decide how long our mesocycle of training should be. So for one dedicated period of training, how many weeks of overloading training should we do before a deload? Some things to keep in consideration when determining this is figuring out how quickly can that athlete accumulate fatigue. And generally, the bigger, stronger, more advanced athlete you're dealing with, the quicker they will accumulate fatigue because the weights they're lifting are heavier, they are closer to the uh, the peak of their career, so they're going to need shorter mesocycles, while smaller, less experienced, less strong athletes will not have the ability to generate as much fatigue and they can get into having a bit longer mesocycles. So being able to train hard longer before needing a planned deload. So for those, the range that they're going to fall into is pretty much two to six weeks of hard training. Some people could probably go beyond six, but for the purposes of this, we're gonna say two to six weeks of hard overloading training followed by a one week deload. So those, those bigger, stronger, more advanced athletes, I'm most often writing three or four plus one, so three weeks of hard training or four weeks of hard training plus a one week deload, while those smaller, uh, weaker, less advanced athletes often are doing four to five weeks of hard training plus a one week deload. Uh, the two or six, two plus one or six plus one, those are just kind of extremes on, on either side. So a two plus one athlete would have to be extremely strong, extremely explosive, and probably have some diminished recovery capacity as well, maybe like a manual labor job. Well, that six plus one isn't uh, all that uncommon. Uh, I just don't find myself actually writing those programs that, that often, but that would just be a, a very new lifter, um, small weight class, more likely than not a female lifter who can do six weeks of hard training before needing a deload. And we wanna plan these deloads for two main reasons. First, if you're preparing for a meet, you have a fixed timeline uh, as part of that preparation. So as we continue our discussion on how to proportion these, these phases between hypertrophy strength and peaking, you don't wanna be sort of having to adjust on the fly. You know that you have X amount of weeks, you know, maybe 16 weeks to prepare for the competition. So you don't want to get six weeks into that and say, oh, I don't, I don't need to deload yet and keep pushing that hypertrophy phase out longer and longer. And then end up pushing that so long that you realize, well, now I don't have enough adequate time for my strength uh, block and peaking block to prepare for the competition. So that's reason number one. The second reason is that if you're trying to deload by feel, more often than not, I think you're gonna run into a problem of non-functional overreaching. So basically, you're gonna realize you need a deload after you needed a deload. Uh, and a lot of times I see this, particularly with uh, more beginner and intermediate lifters, where their own enthusiasm to train hard sort of dooms them because they, they wanna think, oh, I can keep pushing through this and I don't need to take a deload yet, when in reality, they should have taken a deload and by the time they end up taking one, maybe now they're gonna need two deload weeks uh, rather than just one to be able to decay all the fatigue they've accumulated or uh, even worse case, maybe they got an injury. So I'd, I definitely prefer the planned deloads. You can learn more about that in our principle of fatigue management video as part of our scientific principles of strength training playlist. So go check that out. So now that we figured out what our paradigm is gonna look like, three plus one, four plus one, five plus one, whatever it may be for you, we wanna look at our total phase length. So how hard or how long should we be doing directed training for competition? All right, and this would exclude off-season type of training. Uh, sometimes I'll refer to that as a bridge phase, which is sort of like a program that takes you from one meat preparation program to another meat preparation program, or it could be a GPP program. Things that, that 
you know, yes, if your goal is being a powerlifter, powerlifter, all of this training is to improve your competition results, to improve your meet result. So if we want to get, you know, nitpicky about the language being used here, yeah, I guess it's all directed meet uh, training. But go with me and, and draw this distinction that when you're, you know, 22 weeks out from competition and you're doing farmer's walks and rowing and box jumps and, and training that uh, is less specific to powerlifting, I'm not including that uh, in what I'm referring to here as directed uh, meat preparation. If you want to learn more about that type of training, uh, I have a couple of Beers with Chad episodes about that one called My Biggest Powerlifting Mistake, another one called uh, Putting the G in Your PP. I'm very good with the clever names, you know, uh, so go check those out. But I am not including that when referring to uh, training directed for meat preparation. So bigger, stronger, more advanced lifters find tend to do better with shorter meat programs, probably eight to 14 weeks. And this goes hand in hand with their ability to more quickly accumulate fatigue. The training they're doing as they get really big, really strong is just much more stressful to their bodies as well as if, when you've been doing it you know, for 10 years instead of one year, it's probably more stressful to your mind as well because you just have a lot more invested in it um, you know, the focus it takes to get ready for a squat session with 800 pounds is a lot more than what it takes to be ready for one with 300 pounds. So it just weighs heavier on your mind. And, uh, if you're anything like me over time of doing more and more powerlifting, your, your soul gets beaten down by it. So you just can't you know, go all in for, for quite as long. So I find that eight to 14 week programs for more advanced, bigger, stronger lifters, to work better, while less advanced, weaker, less experienced, uh, uh, sm smaller, weaker, less advanced lifters can use a bit longer training programs because they're still, you know, full of youth and vigor. Uh, and they can get away with 12, maybe as long as 24 week training programs. And I had people ask me, well, Chad, I, I'm not planning to compete for a year. So can I do a year long program for that meet? Sure, if you want to, but, but you know, that, that might work well for you one time and odds are you're not going to be able to, to put a year of extremely organized, structured training, you know, back to back with another year of that, with another year of that. You're going to need to mix some bridge, some bridge programs or GPP or just some kind of fun fuck around training in between uh, to keep your body healthy, to give you new movement patterns, to... to you know, and to give your mind a break from uh, powerlifting, which can be a fairly monotonous sport. But if you want to do the best training, produce the best meat result, you're going to have to do that highly specific training when it matters. So all that stuff, the GPP stuff can matter, but how general your GPP is has to be taken into consideration. And as it becomes too general, it's something I wouldn't count uh, towards this idea of dedicated meat preparation. So those smaller, weaker, less advanced lifters I think can do well with 12 to 24 week uh, meat preparation programs. So now that we know how long the whole uh, meat preparation is going to be and how long each mesocycle within that can be, now we can figure out how to divide this program up into phases of hypertrophy, strength, and peaking. You know, the, the qualities that we really need to be successful as a power lifter. So beginner lifters are relatively lacking muscle mass compared to their advanced counterparts. So they're going to need more hypertrophy training while advanced lifters who are lifting heavier weights are going to need relatively longer peaking phases because it's going to take longer to work up to those heavy weights. So here is an overview of each phase. So first we're looking at hypertrophy. Hypertrophy phases are going to have a potential phase length of three weeks all the way to four months. So six, three weeks to 16 weeks. And it's going to make up anywhere between zero and 50% of your meat preparation. Again, these, these three weeks to four months, I'm only talking about dedicated meat preparation. So not GPP phases, not bridge phases. So anywhere from zero to 50%, and I'll talk about that a, a bit more here. So factors to consider when deciding on your hypertrophy phase length is again, beginner lifters need more muscle. So they're gonna need longer uh, hypertrophy phases relative. So they're gonna be on the longer side of this. This potential phase length though is also controlled a lot by 
your competition calendar. Doing a four month hypertrophy phase isn't gonna be a great strategy if you only have three months before your meet. So let's use some common sense with that. Advanced lifters, if they have maxed out their weight class, if you, you know, if Dan Green or Larry Wheels or Kevin Oak is listening to this uh, and they cut, you know, they cut 35 pounds to, to make their weight class, well, it would not really behoove that lifter to continue building, you know, three or five pounds more of muscle. So now they can cut, you know, 35 pounds to make their weight class and have an even more miserable week or two leading into competition as they're sitting in the sauna. Why the hell did I listen to Chad and have that uh, do that longer hypertrophy phase? This is the worst. You now, so if you've maxed out your weight class, you might not need to do any hypertrophy training. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Female lifters will respond better and need more hypertrophy training compared to similarly qualified male lifters. So we have a male and a female in comparable weight classes. Uh, you know, so for, it would be like a 74 kilo male being the equivalent of like a 57 kilo female. That's about the same. You know, they have about, you know, they're finishing the same at nationals kind of thing. Similar, similar qualifications. The female is going to need a little bit longer hypertrophy because they're going to have a bit harder time building muscle. They're also going to become detrained more quickly. So they won't need as long a peaking phase. So if an athlete was doing 12 weeks of training dedicated for a meet, and you can, you know, expand these numbers uh, as necessary in regards to our potential phase proportion, but for 12 weeks of training, I would expect beginners to do five to six weeks of hypertrophy. It's like 40 to 50% of their training being hypertrophy. Intermediates, maybe four to five weeks of hypertrophy. So they're about 30, 30 to 40% of their training. Maybe, you know, some intermediates who are a bit more muscular, maybe they're only going to do, you know, three weeks of hypertrophy, but somewhere in that range. And advanced lifters do zero to four weeks of hypertrophy. So zero weeks, if, if you have maximized your weight class, you don't need to add any more muscle to become a better lifter, then you might not do any hypertrophy training within this 12 weeks of dedicated training for a meet. That doesn't mean that higher volume training outside of your specific meat preparation couldn't still be beneficial to help improve your work capacity. But again, that's not the dedicated meat training. That's a bridge phase, GPP, or whatever we want to call it. A strength phase is going to be somewhere between three weeks and four months. Similar potential length as the hypertrophy phase. And it's going to make up somewhere between 20 all the way up to 70% of an athlete's dedicated meat training. Some factors to consider here, that strength phases are gonna take up a more substantial part of training for the intermediate and advanced lifter. The beginners needed more hypertrophy. They can't do more hypertrophy and more strength and more peaking. You know, I guess beginners do need more of everything, but the, uh, it's gonna take up a greater proportion for uh, intermediate and advanced lifters. The stronger a lifter becomes, the more fatigue they're able to generate with a given session the longer SRA curves they're going to have, you can learn more about that in our determining frequency video, go give that a watch. The more they're going to need to spread out those overloading sessions in their strength phase, and that may cause the phase to be a little bit longer. They might not be able to squat heavy every fourth day. They might need to do it every sixth day and to get, you know, four overloading squat sessions into that strength phase. Now theirs has to be you know, 24 days instead of 16 days. So that's something to consider in there. If an athlete was doing 12 weeks of directed training for a meet, I would expect beginners to do three to four weeks of strength training. Intermediates, four to five weeks. Advanced lifters, four to six weeks. And very advanced lifters. So these are the people, you know, lifting in the prime time at USAPL Nationals, uh, making the international elite classification in the USPA they could use up to eight weeks of strength training. And this might be, might mean that they're doing no hypertrophy training. These are probably the people who have maximized their weight class. They're as muscular as they can, can be or should be in their weight class. So they could be doing up to eight weeks of strength training in a 12 week dedicated meat program. Finally, peaking. Peaking is going to be anywhere from two weeks to two months long. It's going to take up 15 to 50% of an athlete's training. And some factors to consider here are that beginner lifters, particularly ones in low weight classes and females should have, can have, and should have very short peaking phases. 
this would be a, a situation that if they have an inappropriately long peaking phase, they're actually gonna lose some muscle during that time. And all that hard work they did in hypertrophy earlier in the program, they're gonna actually lose a little bit of muscle because peaking training is inherently low volume. You can't do high volume peaking, then it's, it's not peaking then. So uh, they, to avoid adaptive decay, guess what, I have a video about that too, directed adaptation versus adaptive decay, go watch that. Uh, they want to avoid an inappropriately long peaking phase. So they can, and, and because the weights they're lifting aren't as heavy, it doesn't take as long to work up to them. It won't take as many sessions and their sessions don't have to be as spread out. Conversely, the bigger and stronger an athlete is, the longer peaking phase they will require because it's gonna take them you know, more, more sessions or more time between their overloading sessions to work up to that. For example, if we were to, to think of a very advanced athlete, uh, maybe you know a handsome blue-eyed gentleman, and maybe I finished, or this person, hypothetical person, finished their strength phase squatting about 750 pounds for sets of five. But we needed to finish the peaking phase squatting about 950 pounds for a single. To go from 750 pounds to 950 pounds is not something that you're likely going to be able to do you know one week 800 next week 850 next week 900 next week 950 it just doesn't work quite like that you got to spread those out a bit longer so that's why very advanced lifters could go all the way up to a two month long peaking phase um, they just need more sessions or those sessions to be more spread out to to make those jumps in weight so and also bigger athletes uh, with more muscle don't run that same risk of losing hypertrophy. They'll hold on to their fitness a bit longer. And if you introduce uh, performance enhancing drugs to this, they can maintain that fitness even longer. So if an athlete was doing 12 weeks of directed training for a meet, I would expect beginner lifters to do two or three weeks in peaking. Intermediates, anywhere from two to four weeks. That one stays at two because uh, like an intermediate lightweight female lifter will still require a very short peak. Maybe the beginners, that same intermediate lightweight female who now as an intermediate is doing a two-week peak, maybe when she was a beginner, she could really do a one-week peak. Uh, and then advanced lifters doing three to five weeks of peaking and very advanced lifters, so this is probably 10 plus years of experience. If you refer back to the MR, finding your MRV video and go through the athlete assessment, uh, some of these terms and what I specifically mean by lightweight, beginner, intermediate, advanced, very advanced will be a little bit more clear. Very advanced lifters, particularly in high weight class, males could do up to eight weeks of peaking. So, so this person in 12 weeks, that's why I say, you know, up to 50% of their, their training, if I guess it, it could be even more, it could be up to 75% in, in the situation of 12 week meat preparation, that would be like four weeks of strength and 12 weeks of peaking, or maybe more like six weeks of strength, six weeks of peaking. Finally, a very common question that I receive and some of you are probably thinking right now is, Chad, can I mix phases together? The answer is yes. You can do, you know, be in hypertrophy for one lift and strength for another lift without jeopardizing too much the concept of directed adaptation, which again, go watch the directed adaptation versus adaptive resistance video. And where I most commonly see this being able to be applied is that the bench responds the best to hypertrophy and because the weights you're lifting on it are the relative lightest of squat bench and deadlift it will require the shortest peaking phase so you could stay in hypertrophy for the bench while maybe you move on to strength in the squat and deadlift and then maybe you stay in strength for the bench while you move on to peaking for the squat and deadlift a structure that may look something like this over the course of four weeks so we're in hypertrophy for all three in phase one then in phase two, we go to strength for the squat, stay in hypertrophy for the bench, go to strength for the uh, deadlift. In phase three, move on to strength for the squat, st uh, stay in strength for the squat, move on to strength for the bench press, and now maybe you're in peaking in the deadlift because it's so, maybe you're a better deadlifter or just the weights are heavier or you get really fatigued from a little bit higher volume in the deadlift, so now you've moved on to peaking in the deadlift. And then finally in phase four, you're in peaking for all of the lifts. 
Now, this idea of mixing phases together, may you may also extend this concept to different length mesocycles, like that you train a three plus one on the squat and deadlift, but a four plus one on the bench press and stitch together different numbers like that to make your 16 week training cycle or whatever it is. I'm not as big a fan of that because then, then you're in deloads, a deload for one week while you're still in overloading training uh, on the other lifts. And I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that just because you can't dec decay systemic fatigue the same way. It's not the worst thing. It's not impossible for you to be a really good lifter if you do that. But again, it's not something that I suggest though mixing different, mixing different phases together with the same length mesocycles can definitely be done effectively. I just avoid being in hypertrophy in one lift when you get to peaking in another lift. Don't get two phases apart from each other. So hopefully that gave you some good information uh, in terms of determining your phase length and your proportion of hypertrophy strength and peaking to uh, really take advantage of the principle of phase potentiation and give you effective strategic long-term programming. Check out the other videos, finding your MRV, finding your frequency, direct adaptation versus adaptive resistance, scientific principles of strength training video series, the scientific principles of strength training book, and my newest book, Powerlifting Program Design Manual, so you can learn how to design effective programs for yourself, for your athletes, for now, and for the entirety of their lifting career. Understand the principles so you can solve all the problems. That's why I don't wanna just tell you, well, three plus one is the best and two times a week squatting is the best because I would be doing you a disservice if I did that because while it might be the right answer for some of you or even a lot of you, I want you to understand the reason so it can be the right answer for everyone watching, the right answer for you now, six months from now, three years from now, five years from now, when you're 16 weeks out or when you're six weeks out from a meet. If you understand the principles, you can understand the right answers for all of those situations. So thank you very much for watching. Subscribe to the channel. I'll see you next time.